we are first creating a vector, we are first filling in the entries of the vector corresponding to the original email token and then we are, let's say, prefixing the user's ID to this email and then, and then, and then, and then also filling in those tokens, right? So what does this do? If, it, if you kind of think about it, that what this does is that the classifier that we are learning really is a, is a weight just over, over, over this entire space and now every user's classifier has two components, can be written in these two components, right? If you look at the global tokens, there's a weight on the global tokens, the weight that the classifier puts on the global tokens. If you look at the user-specific tokens, there's a, there's a user-specific, there's a weight that the classifier puts on the user-specific tokens. And that, and that weight is actually the user-specific weight, right? That weight is trained only by the feedback given by this user, right? Because these tokens are user-specific. So essentially, if I train a sort of a classifier over this very huge dimensional space, one simple classifier over this huge dimensional space, that will correspond to a classifier like this. And why is this nice? This is nice because even if you have not provided me, uh, uh, I mean, any feedback, even if the user I has not provided any feedback, he or she gets to use this part of the classifier, which is trained by everybody else's feedback. So it's, a, it's in some sense a good prior. Right? If a user gives more and more feedback, this part of the classifier becomes more and more yeah, important in making the in making the decision, and therefore the, the effect of the global classifier decreases. So this is nice. Right? Users who, who who give back more to the system also also get their own personalized classifier. But the problem now remains that now my size of this vector space is huge, right? Dimension. It's the number of users times vocabulary. What have I done? Okay. Uh, and then, and I, I cannot afford to keep this in that, although it's very sparse, although it's very sparse. But uh, I mean, how am I going to do things over this over this huge dimensional vector space? So we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay. So 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 what we really need is a is a method to compress these vectors into available memory, okay? So, so let's say we have such a method. Let's do a thought experiment. So what are the properties you need from this method, right? Okay, first of all, I claim that, that this method should be a linear method, right? And why is a linear important? Because remember, uh, what we wanted to do, we wanted to update the classifiers often, right? And one way that these classifiers get updated is by doing a simple stochastic gradient descent, right? So now if the method is linear, if, if my compression method is linear, right, then any update I do on the, any update I wanted to do on the original one, I can actually do on this, on this compressed thing, because of the linearity, it will be a simple, uh, it, it, it will be fairly simple. So I want a linear, some compression method that is linear. Okay? It should potentially have guarantees, because we are theoreticians, we like, theory, you know, we are, we like some kind of guarantees. It should maintain sparsity. Right? So what does it mean? What it means is that, that, that see, each email, although I've represented it in this very high dimensional space, it's a very sparse vector. Right? Because every email contains like, what, 100 tokens, right? And, uh, and now it's, it's, it's at uh, 200 non-zero entries in a billion trillion sized dimensional space. Right? So then if I, if I reduce it to like, uh, I mean, 10,000 dimensions but blow up the number of non-zero entries, it doesn't serve me well. Right? Because my, my sort of cost now goes up. So I, I, I want the compression technique uh, to sort of maintain sparsity as much as possible. So then, I mean, linear compression, what do we, I mean, linear sort of, uh, uh, so linear operator, what do we know? We only know matrices, right? Okay, so, so basically I'm saying that I multiply this vector by some matrix, right? so that I can maintain somehow some kind of guarantees about the structure of the classification problem in the original space and the structure of the classification problem in this new space. I want to maintain guarantees not clear what it means. Uh, we'll just formally see in a minute uh, what does it mean to have guarantees. And it should also maintain sparsity, which means that if the input vector is sparse, the output vector should also be sparse. So let's keep these requirements in mind. Let's put another problem. Huh? Uh, this is called named entity disambiguation. So what is this named entity question? So let's say we have text, right? And these three lines. Uh, the first one says that uh, Jordan scored more points than anyone in NBA last season. Jordan had a press conference today in which outlined his plans for the coming year. Trump should not take Jordan for granted, right? And now we all know that there are different, different Jordans, right? There's Jordan, there's, there's Jordan statistician, Jordan the basketball player, Jordan the country, Jordan the river, uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe there are others, right? So, so, so how can, I mean, take, given each of these sentences, can we link each of them, each of these named entities? This is a named entity, Jordan. Similarly, MB is a named entity. Can we say which actual underlying entity is Jordan pointing to? Okay. This, is, this is the task. 
Okay, so this is a this we have switched gears and we have moved into a different task which is going to apply multitask learning again. So and as you might guess that so essentially it's a it's a it's a multi-class uh, kind of problem. That given this, I have to say that okay, is this Jordan this or this or the country? Is apple, given the appearance of apple in a sentence, is this apple uh, the fruit, is this apple the company, or is it something else? Or is it a big apple? New York City. Right? As you might guess, that there are, I mean, uh, one sort of obvious intuition is that let's look at the other entities in this in this text, right? Here it says MBA, season. So therefore, it's possibly it's possibly Jordan the uh, Jordan basketball player. Trump should not be Jordan for granted. A little more tricky. I don't know. Maybe Trump had a has an issue with Michael Jordan, the statistician of the, the basketball player. And it's more likely that it's the country. This I don't know. Maybe it's a basketball player. So, uh, so then, I mean, as you know, let's, I mean, but at least you can get a better sense of what the entity is by looking at the other, other words. Okay. So, so here is how we'll phrase it as a, as a, as a classification problem. That we'll take the entity as a task, right? The, the mention of the mention of the entity as, as a task. So here, the first mention Jordan, that is the task. We have to classify it upon the existing entities that we have. So let's say that the existing entities are given by the pages in the Wikipedia, because if you look in Wikipedia, it gives a unique link. Let's say that is my target. My features for this for this task will be built by looking at the at what are the other words, what are the other entities appearing in that sentence in the neighborhood of this entity. Okay. Based on this, I am going to set up a classification problem that says that okay, is this Jordan basketball player, statistician, or or, or country? Okay. There's also a very interesting uh, work, and I forgot to put the reference here uh, from Google that says that actually rather than taking all the words. It's it's uh, you can generalize better if you take a small number of uh, if uh, if you choose only the top features the top performing features for every task. For instance, for for this Jordan, if you take I mean some of the features turn out to be better performing. Uh, a small number of features turn out to be better performing than the rest. Then you should only focus on those. Uh, then you get better uh, uh, generalization. Okay. So 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 here is what we uh, here is what uh, we I mean uh, this is kind of like the plan, right? That it's also it's also been observed that in some sense uh, finding out a shared representation of the features is a is a is a, is a nicer idea. What does it mean? What it means is that that uh, let's say let, let's say that uh, we're talking in terms of a neural network. Although neural network here just makes it appearance for the sake of it. That let's say this is this is uh, this is a particular uh, instance of Jordan, right? And and, and and we build a feature set for it, the feature vector for it, right? Uh, this is another uh, I mean another uh, task, and we build feature vector for it. Now in finding a now let's say we first find a common shared representation of this of these feature vectors. This common shared representation might be that we map all of them into the same space, let's say one to t, right? In the, in, 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 the, in the same vector space. And then we learn individual classifiers for each of the tasks. Right? And then and then I mean there's been some, some results that say this, that this kind of a structure is actually uh, I mean actually performs fairly nice, nicely. So this is called multitask representation learning. Because you're learning a common representation based on multiple tasks. I'm going into too much details. Right? So 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 this is what is done. However, again, it's the same issue, right? Uh, so the problem is that if you are if you are faced with a, if you're faced with a typical sort of uh, corpus like the Wikipedia, there's like uh, millions of entries and, and billions of mentions, okay? Uh, because each each mention of Jordan, each mention of every named entity is a, is a particular task that you have to build. So 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 I mean, basically, if I want to do such a such a named entity disambiguation, I have to keep many many models in memory, right? And I don't have that much time. So so what am I going to do? So that my our sort of first breakthrough uh, intuition in this is to say that does this common representation really has to be something that your machine is actually learning? I mean, maybe it can be something that is completely oblivious to the data. And what we see is that if you make it completely oblivious to the data, actually that's not so bad. Right? That's a that's a very good first baseline at least. Right? Uh, so this this will be the second task, the second sort of, sort of task in which we we apply our 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 this, our construction. Okay. So, any questions at this? Now we'll sort of go into okay. What is the common mathematical thread that binds at least these two tasks, and then and then try to talk about how to apply that in in these settings. Any questions before that? Yeah. So uh, you motivated your talk by the spam and yes. Are you going to go back to that? Yes, we'll go back to that. Go back to we'll go back to that. We'll go back to that and see and see what to do about it. So, can you quickly tell me how the name entity disambiguation correctly? So, the name entity 
connection. So the only connection is this, that what we are saying is, is that here we are learning a common representation across the tasks. Right? So imagine the imagine the common representation in the in the spam case where we are saying that we are, we are I mean that every email we are multiplying by this uh, 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 that we are taking the global tokens and then we are taking the user specific token. So the uh, the tokens prefix prefix by the user. So every 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 email we are representing in this common space. So that think of that as the as the as a common representation. Here the attempt is some of that common representation, but at least we are uh, the overall framework has been that let's take all the features from all the different tasks, map it into some common representation, and then learn individual classifiers based on the common representation. This is the, the level of similarity. So okay, but we'll go back to each of them and see what what we can do about it. Okay, so so interestingly enough, there's a there's a very celebrated mathematical theorem, and a lot of you might know it. I'll just sort of mention it again. Uh, or the Johnson Lindenstrauss lemma that comes in handy in both these areas. What is the Johnson Lindenstrauss lemma? Right? So so the basic idea is as follows: that suppose you have a bunch of points, right? Some n points in in some very high dimension. Think of the dimension as very high, right? Like the one we had in the email, right? Trillions and some something. And, and then, but what we're really interested in is then getting them mapped to some lower dimensional space such that the pairwise distance between all the points are preserved. Okay? So, all, but, but then there's a problem because already I know that if you take, uh, let's say, the points of a, of a tetrahedron, I cannot even map them from three to two dimensional space while preserving the pairwise distances exactly. I cannot do it. So, then what gets? Turns out you can do it if there's a little bit of slack. Right? If instead of saying that uh, I, I, I preserve the distances exactly, if I say that, okay, give me some error bound, right? uh, some relative error epsilon, let's say 1%, I'll preserve all the pairwise distances to 1 plus minus 1, uh, to 101%, uh, between 99% and 101%, right? well, to a factor of 1 plus minus epsilon. Right? And then, can you sort of find out, a, 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 find out the mapping from this that d dimensional space to this to some other low dimensional space, so that this, I mean, all the pairwise distances between the points are preserved with very high probability. Okay. Turns out you can do this. And turns out that, in a sense, the projection does not even need to look at the data. It's, a, it's an oblivious projection that will perform nicely with very high probability. Okay? The guarantees you'll get is something like this. So P is going to be a matrix, right? A K by D matrix, where K is of a K is a size that depends on two things. That depends on the error that you, uh, the, the error tolerance that you're willing to give, and the probability of success for every pair of points. So let's say you say that okay, for every pair, I want to make sure that this that this quantity holds with probability 99%. In that case, delta is 0.01, right? And this and, and this would be log of this one by delta. Okay. So so uh, so this is fairly curious that this actually holds, right? Because uh, it's not obvious thing because this is pretty deep mathematically in, in, in a sense because this the existence of this transformation itself characterizes the, the fact that the distance is an L2 metric, in fact. So I mean all, if you didn't pass that, just let it go. Uh, so we can essentially do this only only if the distance uh, here is a is a is the is the L2 distance. We cannot do this for the L1 metric or any other metric, it turns out. And it turns out that uh, I have written k to be uh, 1 over epsilon square log 1 over delta. All these dependencies are tight. I cannot improve this. Uh, improve this. It's known that by lower bounds. It's also known that I cannot improve this, which is probably easier to see. Okay. And and, and this technique, uh, people have researched. So what is this matrix? I've just said that it's a matrix, right? So it turns out that there are very interesting constructions of this matrix. So it, uh, and uh, uh, the most celebrated constructions is through what is known as IID Gaussians. So what it means is you take you start with a K by D frame, empty matrix. For every entry, just take a sample from a n01 Gaussian, okay, I have not written it, from an n01 Gaussian, independently, I just start, start filling up all the entries, right? And that's it. That matrix will satisfy this, uh, uh, will satisfy this, prop, uh, this condition that I stated, okay? It, it also turns out that you can also do some things much simpler, right? You can, instead of, uh, instead of taking Gaussians, you can just toss a random coin, probability half, it, it gives you one, probability uh, half, it gives you minus one. That will also work. Other kinds of distributions also work. Right? Some Gaussian. Right? So what is there to do anymore? The problem is that all these constructions give you very dense matrices. Okay? That is all the entries they effectively have to be have to be have to be uh, non-zero physics, right? And uh, 
and, and therefore, if I have a if I have a vector, right? Uh, I mean, uh, if I have a vector, then to sort of multiply, let's say that the vector has this uh, this L zero the L zero norm of the vector is this, which means the number of non zero entries is this. To do the matrix vector multiplication requires this time k times this, which is not not nice uh, uh, because this k is like one by epsilon square. Furthermore, a more important thing is this: if, even if your input vector was sparse, right? Although you have projected it into lower dimension, it has now become dense. Just multiply everything, anything by Gaussian matrix, it becomes dense. Okay. So then what? I mean, we said that we didn't want this. So so so, so what gives? Okay. I mean, as I said, there's a lot of applications of random projection. I mean, I can spend the, the, the entire uh, night talking about that, so I won't talk about that. Okay. Um, so, so the basic. Uh, okay. So why? So why does this work? I'll, I'll just spend a minute to sort of tell you why the random projection works. So, so as a thought experiment, think of what happens if the if the vector x that we start with uh, was all one 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 one. Okay. And I want to. It's in very high dimension. I want to. I want to get a low dimension representation of this vector. So if the vector x is all one 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 one, I can just sample a, uh, some number of entries from that from this vector. Right? And if I sample d entries. I keep it. If I sample k entries, I keep it here. I'll scale up the. I'll scale up the sort of. Uh, is, I'll scale it up by square root n by k. Therefore, the norm of this will be the same as the norm of this. Okay. Fine. So if the, the entries are all one or, or very close to one, then it's easy. But we have to do this for all for all vectors, right? or, or, or at least the, the input points can be adversarially chosen. So, so what can we do this? So think of this kind of transformation. Suppose given any vector, I can transform it in a way so that it represents, so that it kind of looks like the 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 vector. Right? So that, and, and, and that's the norm of the original vector is not changed. Suppose I could do such a transformation. Then I could do a random sampling. Uniform random sampling, right? So, so what is this transformation? In effect, this transformation is nothing but a random rotation. So think of doing a random rotation of the coordinates and then selecting only the top two or three coordinates, top k coordinates. Right? You get the random projection. Effectively, what we are saying is that what the Gaussian matrix is doing is nothing but a combination of random rotation and sampling. So, if you don't understand anything else, just keep this in mind because we'll use this intuition, modify this in, in, in many different settings and use it. Okay? So, so, so all proofs of uh, J is effectively just this intuition. Okay, but this is the trouble that all existing jail constructions were sort of once that turn sparse vectors into dense and hence are kind of unsuitable for, for machine learning applications. Uh, and, 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 and we kind of knew that you cannot do better. If you, uh, there are load bombs that say that you cannot do better than this because, uh, uh, I mean, because of information theory. Yes, right? So what, what happens? Right? Okay, okay, so, so uh, I don't know, maybe I'm a little late. Uh, I, think, I, I, I think I'll, uh, I, okay, let me just talk about it. Uh, just quickly. So one one easy application of, of Johnson linear trust is in solving this kind of problems. And suppose you are solving the ax minus b problem, right? And this is a work constraint system, so you're solving a regression. Okay. So now, uh, I mean, we all know that uh, that this can be done in like uh, by doing QR decomposition, etc. And this can be done in order n squared time, where where the number of rows is n, number of columns is d. Okay. Can we do it faster? Approximate it faster. Okay. So, so here is one, one, one application of J, immediate application of J. So take the take this over constraint system and multiply it on the left hand side, or multiply A and B also on the, uh, uh, both of them on the left hand side by this by this J matrix, right? This J matrix S. So, so now you have two matrices, S A and S B. So solve this problem, this smaller problem. Remember that this is a much smaller problem, right? This this K will be appropriately chosen for the much smaller. Turns out that this will be a good approximation to the to the this solution will be a good approximation to the original problem. Right? So so this is all very good, right? But I mean that's not going to uh, what k needs to be and so on. It turns out that with the with the dense projections, this is not any faster than the original algorithm. Right? Because the projection runtime in itself, calculate the projection itself takes this much time, n square. So not very efficient because I could have solved the problem exactly in n square. Right? So but what if can I do this? What if the matrix A was sparse, right? I mean, then calculating the matrix A might actually take more space because of the because everything has been densified. So this is not this is not good either. What can we do? Here is what we do. We say that we can actually make jail sparse and we can beat all the existing plot bonds. But how can we do this? We can do this because we are effectively changing how the jail matrices have been constructed. 
So, I mean, unknowingly, all the JL matrices that have been constructed previously, and what I described, uh, <coughs> consisted of point, I mean, the, all the entries being chosen independently, being created independently. Suppose we are not doing this. Suppose think of the think of this kind of uh, this kind of an operation. So think of first a uh, kind of hash function. So what does a hash function do? Hash function for every uh, dimension of the input vector, it sort of uh, says uh, locates two or three let's say three dimensions, three locations for the target vector. It says that whatever you have here, you will split it and put it in each of these three positions, right? So. But you'll also do one thing, when you are uh, uh, taking a value from here to here, you will also toss a random coin for deciding what the sign of that entry should be. Right? For instance, this gets multiplied by minus 1 and then put here, this gets multiplied by plus 1 and put here, this gets multiplied by minus 1 and put here. Okay? So this is going to be my projection. Why is this a projection? Because you can represent this using a, using a random, yeah, I mean, using a matrix. What is the matrix? Effectively, the matrix is saying that, that look at, the, start with the t by d frame, now decide for every for every column, right? Decide how I mean. Uh, so choose c positions that you are going to make non-zero. Everything else will be zero. In these c positions, toss a random coin and put a plus one or minus one. Right? So now the positions are not being chosen independently. We are deciding that we'll put exactly non-zero in c positions. Okay? And this turns out that this. Is has much nicer properties. Not only does it satisfy, uh, not only does it satisfy sort of uh, uh, all the JL properties. Now, because the matrix itself is so sparse, so see what happens if the if the vector is sparse. So if you multiply this by a vector that has only one one, you will get a vector that has only two ones because there's only two non-zero entries. It will isolate a col it will identify a column in this matrix and it will just just give me one 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 vector. Uh, that column, which is only uh, uh, non-zero entries. So effectively, what this does is that it sort of preserves the sparsity much, much better than any of the other Johnson registers. This has been improved. Uh, again, to say that, uh, okay, uh, I mean, uh, this has been improved and that goes into a little bit of technicality. Let's not go into this. Uh, and, uh, okay, and, uh, and in fact, okay, so one, one specific improvement is that uh, you can actually just choose one non-zero position for every column. Turns out that that itself is a projection matrix that works very nicely uh, under, uh, for certain set of tasks, right? But again, I won't go into uh, too much of this of this construction because other interesting things. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is, the, is this is the any question until now? Okay. If I'm going a little too fast. Ah, so this was done by Katz and Woodruff that says that, okay, if you have this kind of a projection matrix, then it doesn't preserve distances, but it preserves distances if the points are coming from a subspace, from a low-dimensional subspace, which turns out is actually enough for a lot of these things. Uh, so these are the kind of embeddings that we use, okay? And uh, now how do we use these in our settings? Okay. It turns out that the way to use this in our settings is as follows. Now, remember that this is where we have, uh, where we best are. That we created this unified representation for every email uh, that, that, uh, that took the global tokens as well as user specific tokens, right? And now we don't have, now we don't know uh, what to do with this huge dimension representation. What we'll do, so think of this as the, as the huge dimension in, in which the points are. Now what we want to do is that we want to say that, let, can I create a representation, right, in which the geometry of the points is preserved. So why, uh, uh, what do I mean by geometry? That suppose I'm preserving all the time-wise distances of the points, then if the spam points are far off from the, from the non-spam points, then it'll be far off, the projections will also be far off, the corresponding projections will also be far off from each other. So it means that if the points are linearly separable in the original space, they'll also be more or less linearly separable in this lower dimensional space. Right? So, so this is what we do. That essentially, this is known as a hashing trick. That we take this, we take this huge dimensional space, we apply the hashing, right, to to convert this into into a space, and the and the dimension of the space is decided by a memory constraint. Effectively, in, in practice, that you say that okay, I can afford uh, this many, this many, this much memory for each of the uh, for each of the uh, in, uh, vector. So let us apply this, turns out, and the and, and the and the, and then you learn the entire classification on this space. Turns out this this works very nicely. Right? Uh, in effect. Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, experiment done in actual uh, real Yahoo email data, which is why I can't show you the actual numbers. These are relative numbers. Black line is the baseline, and this red line 
is the so this accuracy baseline, uh, and this red line is is our is our is our classifier, and we actually deploy this in practice in the and and, and since then it has gotten deployed in a, in a bunch of places. It has uh, it's available and 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 I mean. Initial, so the initial idea was actually developed by John Langford, on, uh, and uh, but sort of our work provided the uh, the underlying uh, connection to random projection and all the necessary proofs. Since then, it's available in, in let's say uh, uh, all the machine learning libraries. Uh, it's been used in many deep networks, a lot of matrix factorizations, and so on. Uh, so okay. So, yeah. What's the baseline here? In the also the baseline. The baseline here is uh, the the red bay. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, if I see the baseline here, the baseline the, the global hashed. Uh, hold on, I think the baseline is. I think the baseline is uh, the, the baseline is just one class. Uh, ha, the baseline is just one classifier without hashing. Just one classifier without hashing. That's a black thing. The blue thing is the the global classifier uh, with hashing. So that's why uh, it's uh, it's a little worse. When the uh, when you're when the hashing dimension is small, but it quickly catches up. So, so obviously it has been normalized at every point, for every point, so that the baseline sticks to one. Uh, and 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 then this is the classifier where uh, where we're doing hashing, but we are sort of first providing this user-specific representation and then doing the hashing, uh, which essentially means that we are doing this personalization. Okay. And 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 and, and uh, so, so if you look at the numbers, with three million users, 433k, the dimension of the space would be terabytes. If you have to use terabytes, but we use only like 256 MB. It's eminently practical. Okay? Uh, and I really liked it because it sort of gave us new problems for random projection. Okay, so so now so now coming back to the least squared regression. Now, if the matrix is A sparse, I'll apply the sparse projection matrix. Everything depends as it is. I'll apply the sparse projection matrix, I'll solve the resulting problem. And now it turns out that we can solve regression in time that is linear in the number of non zeros of the original matrix. Which is, which is pretty cute. Right? Uh, so, turns out that uh, using this hashing matrix, the numerical stability is sometimes a little worse. So, if you are really using iterative methods, uh, if you are really numer numeric linear algebra person, uh, you have to be a little careful. But, uh, yeah, in machine learning applications, it doesn't matter so much always. Okay? Uh, it's also seen. It's also been shown that this big beats LFX uh, dense uh, dense D square solver by large margin, right? which is uh, very interesting because LFX has been optimized for about like 25 years now. Okay. Uh, okay. Coming back, name identity is ambiguous. Unfortunately, this is a little different. Right? We can we can make this we can make this work. Uh, as in, we can put in uh, a hashing way, uh, uh, sort of sparse random projection here. Uh, and, and we get good baselines. However, it turns out we can do much better because there's a machine learning problem, right? And we can actually learn this representation, right? And this was the this was the result of recent work with uh, with with Rijula and others. This is really Rijula's work. That uh, what we say is that okay, uh, learning a common representation across tasks uh, is is good, and using learned rep representations is better than using hashed representations right? by a few percent. However, what is even better is if you is if you sort of flip the problem, right? That if you make the representation task specific, but if you make you tie the optimization problems together using a common scoring function, okay? What it means is that the structure of this neural network suddenly changes. Now, for a, from every task, right? We are we have a we have a task specific uh, uh, representation matrix that maps this feature vector into uh, an, an, into in, into some space. And then the and then the scoring matrix, the scoring vector is common across all the tasks. Right? So this is what ties the uh, ties the uh, the, uh, the different optimizations together. So this way, this is recent work. This we call the task specific representation learning. It turns out that rather than proving uh, the, the rather than proving the uh, uh, the random projection kind of uh, statements, which say that uh, which say that uh, I mean the pairwise distances uh, pairwise distances are preserved, we can prove generalization bounds. Right? Which say that so generalization error bound is saying that if you if you get this much error on training set, what is the extra error that you expect on the test set? This is the generalization error. Okay, and we can kind of bound the generalization. So so don't worry about all the formula here. The gen we can bound the generalization error using a bunch of quantities. Uh, one quantity out here is called is kind of called the Gaussian width. Kind of represents how complex your hypo uh, your sort of function space is. And the other uh, quantity kind of represents how smooth the functions are in some sense. Okay. 
so, so this is the recent work, and it out, I mean, outperforms a bunch of uh, I mean very well established baselines on this CoNL uh, data set, which is a pretty big established data set. Okay, so this is the uh, anything there. Okay, I have two twenty minutes. Amazing. Uh, so now we'll talk about uh, uh, Nobel prizes. Okay. And uh, I'm shifting gears a little. So, uh, any, any questions here? Yeah. So this is uh, like. Uh, so you briefly mentioned that random projections are also used for instance in Pantar embedding. Right? Yes. So well, uh, I don't say random projections. It's random embeddings. Random so, embeddings. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there we sort of know that randomization is necessary in some sense because one tree cannot give you like uh, yeah. So like is this bottle like also there in these cases? Like do you really need randomization or is there any hope that in some cases you can do away with randomization? Like, yeah. There are some results. There are some results that say that you can definitely decrease the amount of randomness, right? So you can you can do that two ways. One is that you could apply some black box uh, hammer like uh, Nissan's uh, pseudo randomness generator, so things like this. Or there are more refined uh, randomness, and we'll see. I don't know. Very much. Yes, maybe we'll see an example towards the end in which you can effectively take uh, Fourier type matrices. You can take Hadamard matrix. You can add a little bit of randomness to it, and that will perform more or less nicely. So there is also that intuition, right? And that and that involves lesser number of random bits than this. Okay? There are also other de-randomizations of this of these algorithms. So I, I I mean uh, I don't know so much details we can discuss. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, you told that like when you project it uh, in your projection, so if, if the if, if the projected uh, vector is uh, sparse or dense, if, if the yes. original vector is sparse, so in our projection, the original vector is sparse. The projected vector is denser. But sparser than the what you would get using the the Johnson the the, the Gaussian matrix. So, but but the, your 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 main aim is to get a low dimensional uh, vector representation. That that should be dense enough, right? Well, it depends what you want, right? I mean, you want you want it to be. Uh, I mean, there are two conflicting things, right? Okay. The so in order to preserve, so you want to preserve geometry. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what you really want, right? And so, how much density is required to preserve geometry? That is the question. Okay. Because sparsity is always is always nicer, right? And uh, what uh, what we say is that okay, fine. If the if the original vector is completely dense, uh, that I mean that solves one one category of this thing, one category of problems. However, in the in the category of problems that we in the in this in this in this email thing, we needed some. I mean, we cannot sort of suppose the the size of this vector is fills up the entire memory. It's like uh, it, it's uh, it's 256 memory. I, I I mean, if I'm trying to do a stochastic gradient descent update, I don't want to go into each of the memory cells and do the updating. That's why I, we need a best okay. there. But there is I agree that there is uh, another motivation that says that of course if you make it dense, you are you are kind of preserving more information or something. Yeah. Have, yeah. You, have you checked your your method with all these <coughs> latest embedding techniques? No. So, so which method? If, if you say the random projection method, I'm sure that has been checked, right? And of course, it performs uh, worse with respect to the latest embedding. And the latest embedding, you don't get the theoretical guarantees. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that's the trade-off. Uh, this is not data. This is data oblivious, but you're getting some guarantees. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very decent base thing. If you look at this result, uh, if you look at so, so this is the, this is the, this is our, this is our hash. Uh, the, the original hash, right? And we're getting from 87% to 89% after doing all this. Mm -hmm. Which at the end of the day is like, what is not? I mean, you have to do this, otherwise, what are you doing research about? But uh, it's, a, it's a very decent thing. Okay. Any other question? I'll we'll move to the last 15 minutes. And it's going to be, going to be I, 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 I don't know, this is how physics. So, uh, okay. so this is the problem, right? Uh, very simple. Finding nearest neighbor. So we are getting, given a bunch of query points. Uh, you, you're given a bunch of points, you're allowed to pre-process the points as you want. Right? It doesn't matter how much you pre-process. However, this is this is what you have to answer. Given a query point, right, you have to answer which are which are my near points to this query. There are different variants of this question. Right? You could ask which is my nearest neighbor, which are my k nearest neighbors, which are my neighbors within a radius r. You could ask different variants of this. And you could even reduce one to the other using using multiple. Sorry, using multiple calls. So why is this important? Obviously, there's a k nearest neighbor question. 
algorithm, right? Which performs exactly this kind of queries. Right? There's also it, uh, uh, there's also uh, many other applications. I'm going to talk about one application, which is live astronomy, right? Gravitational waves. So I don't know much about gravitational waves, to be frank. But I'll, I'll, I'll sort of tell you how to map gravitational waves into my computation problem. So gravitational waves is this is this is this particular is this very uh, interesting kind of almost poetical description, which are ripples in the fabric of space time. That's what they call it, and it just sounds nice. And uh, yeah, uh, so basically, what happens is that if if two binary masses, large binary masses, are sort of circulating against each other, they send these gravitational waves. And now we have detectors in Earth, on Earth to capture these gravitational waves. Right? And, and based on this, we can say a lot of things. We can, uh, I mean, this is a signal that we have not seen uh, before. We have not sort of measured before. This, this gravitational wave signal. And basically it has opened a sort of new kind of uh, uh, sort of measurement of astronomy because we know about uh, uh, a lot more about the, about the primitive state of the universe. And of course it got a Nobel Prize here uh, in 2017, 2016, yeah, 2017. Okay, so, uh, so but, but what is the underlying problem? The basic underlying problem is really this. That what they really do after, after a lot of modeling and everything is that they build what is known as a template matrix. So, so every, so think of every entry of the temp, uh, every row of a matrix as a template of a binary coalescence of a, of a pair of binary stars. It represents one set of parameters uh, of the of, of a binary star, and the the uh, and the values are essentially the time series corresponding to that template. Right? And if the binary star coalescence exactly corresponded to this chosen set of uh, parameters, this is what the time series would look like. Right? This is what the uh, this is what every row represents. Now what they do is that they take the signal, right, which is the uh, which is denoted by S, and basically they say that okay, which row does it correspond to any of these rows? That's it, really. That's it. The computation problem, right? Except that the definition is is a is a is sort of uh, they have to do convolutions and things like this because they have to take care of time and so on. Uh, so, but 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 at the end of the day, this is a nearest neighbor problem, right? And uh, and we have to solve this. So it turns out that uh, yeah, so there are a lot of issues. So without going into these nice pictures, there are a lot of issues. One is that okay, these the size of these matrices are fairly large, right? Because uh, the I mean, uh, if the if the binary stars are much uh, are, are, are larger, then they send out see gravitational waves are very sort of high, low frequency, which means that you have to really consider a long stretch of time, right? And uh, and this uh, leads us to this to this curse of dimensionality, right? There's the number of parameters also is huge, right? If you if you go from things like okay 0.5 solar masses to 10 solar masses, the number of possible set of parameters blows up. Um, I mean, and the size of these matrices can be anything of the order of, of a million by billion, right? And and these are very dense matrices. So and you want to do this in almost real time. So why? Because now what happens is that once you detect a gravitational wave, you can immediately position a lot of uh, telescopes to point to that region of space, and you can detect a lot of other things, right? Which are called the transient. Uh, electromagnetic uh, counterparts. Okay, so uh, so what that means is that at every point in time, we have to be solving this nearest neighbor question in <coughs> semi in, in, in near real time, right? And and, and and I have to do that accurately because I cannot be spending resources. So 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 how do we do this? It turns out that this randomization, this uh, this Johnson inertia comes in very very handy, right? Because one of the things that they have been doing is that they have been sort of instead of to reduce the size of this matrix, I mean, very really, vaguely really speaking, to reduce the size of the matrix, they have been doing SVD of the matrix, right? And they have been doing SVD of the matrix and then working with the low dimensional representation of the matrix. Okay? This is called, this is worked by uh, people from, uh, from, from the LIGO, Kit Cannon, and others, they're all physicists. Okay? Turns out we can do this, uh, I mean, uh, we can do this, we can do this randomized. Okay, also, also the, one other thing to point out is that doing SVD is actually useful because of the nature in which this matrix is generated. Because this matrix comes from essentially putting points in a parameter space. And because they're putting points in a parameter space, the inherent rank of this matrix is kind of low. Right? So therefore, the, I mean, taking a low rank version of the matrix and working with it actually doesn't really cause that much errors. Right? Turns out we can actually use randomization to calculate this, uh, I mean, this low rank decomposition. Right? That what we do is basically as follows. That we take the original matrix, Take first a projection into, into, into some dimension. Because it preserves, because the projection preserves, uh, preserves uh, dist pairwise distances, it preserves a lot of the similar value structure. Which means that we can calculate orthogonal basis in this lower dimension 
And that actually is a, is a, is a fairly accurate orthogonal basis in the original dimension. Right? So this is work by Halko Martinson and Trump. Nothing, nothing sort of new here, okay? I mean, as in, it's new here, but it was new to the physicists, but nothing new in the algorithmic sense. Here's one drawback. This, these algorithms, they all need to know what should be the target rank. As in, if I'm, if I'm calculating a low rank decomposition, what should be the L? This is a no, no, no notion of what is L, right? They only know that, okay, this is the amount of error we are willing to tolerate, right? Based on that, can you even tell me that what, is, what should be the low rank decomposition? And this is what we have, right? What we say is that we give, without sort of going into the, uh, going into this, uh, the details of this, that we can do this blockwise. We can do this block iteratively in a blockwise manner, uh, and we take small random matrices, multiply the template matrix using the small random matrices, sort of, uh, I mean, calculate the decomposition, see what the error is. If the error doesn't match up to what you really want, we do this again, and we keep on doing this, and we keep on stacking the pieces like this. It works nicely. And uh, it also, we can also distribute this. So now it has been distributed on, uh, we have a distributed implementation of this on multiple machines. Right? And we have sent this to the, uh, and this is the distributed I mean, implementation. We don't have time for this, and we have sent it to, uh, to PRL, and we'll see what happens. Okay? Uh, so, this, so this is where I, I kind of want to leave and, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, anyway, distributed rank filtering SVT. So this is where I come, kind of, and, 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 and this is the picture that it really works nicely. So the blue ones, or the red ones, are the, are the, are the original singular values, and the blue ones are the singular values that we find using using my randomized after doing my randomized projection, and and uh, it, it matches up fairly nicely until we we sort of take a projection into dimension 60, and it matches almost exactly until the, until 58 or 59. So it really works. Uh, in this for these data sets and plus and, and it comes to this with this uh, with these kind of uh, uh, with these kind of uh, guarantees but there is more to be done as i was saying that this nearest neighbor there is also this existing data structures that are called locally sensitive fashion techniques right? which kind of says something like this that there is this i won't tell you what this hash function is there is a hash function that has this magical property Right? That if I if you map these points into these hash into these buckets, right, then two points that are close will have a higher probability of, of being in the same bucket. Therefore, if I'm querying a particular point, I'll do for, I'll do this hashing first, and then and then I'll query only in this only in this bucket, and that will actually give me a good approximation, uh, and that will actually give me a near neighbor, right? If not this bucket, then maybe the near uh, nearby buckets. So these are all different variants of, of what is known as this local descent hashing. And designing this hash function is what is the critical thing. Given the, everything that we have heard, it won't surprise me if I, if I now reveal that this, that this hash function is again has to do with the random projection that we did. And if we do a random projection and then we kind of do a partition, do a, I mean, convert them into, put them into buckets. That's what it effectively is there. And uh, well, uh, we also had another, and this is what the, this is what same hash is. So we also had another result that said that you don't actually have to do a random projection. This refers to a uh, uh, seventh X question. That remember in random projection, what we are saying, random projection corresponds to random rotation plus sampling. We can do something like this. We can we can take two matrices instead of this Gaussian matrix. One matrix is a Hadamard, what is known as a Hadamard matrix. If you don't know what a Hadamard matrix, just uh, think of it as a as a Fourier transformation on the DLs. And so on, and that so that we can calculate it. We can do a matrix vector multiplication in n log n time rather than n square. Uh, so we take the Hadamard matrix, and then we take a diagonal matrix only a Gaussian matrix, and then this matrix kind of performs like this in terms of having the same intuition that there is a rotation plus there is a sampling, right? and it works nicely. It actually works nicely for for certain classes of vectors. But we can also sort of get rid of that. We can we can do multiple compositions of these matrices. And we can, and we actually have results on faster locality sensitive hashing. So, 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 so this I showed next to the, the physics uh, sort of the, the LIGO because we are ho uh, hoping to apply some of these LSH techniques on the LIGO problem uh, I mean, after this. So, instead looking into it because there are other some some other issues that I can discuss on, uh, offline. But but this is the hope that it's really a nearest neighbor problem at its heart. So we should be able to apply these things that we have sort of known. Anyway, so so just kind of summarizing. Uh, what we see is that, I mean, the, the, the story that I wanted to tell you is that these randomized projections, random projections are a very effective tool 
uh, in this in, in numerical linear algebra, and they come with this with this with this very nice duality of having very strong theory underlying your performance as well as giving good performance on real data. Uh, what is interesting is that there's been flow the other way down. That, that a lot of the motivating applications have also motivated new types of random projections, the development of new types of random projections, which mathematicians hadn't thought of before. Right? The chief boon or complaint, however, you want to call it, is data obviousness. Right? Can I, I mean, and, and this we somehow saw, uh, we saw, we saw a little bit in this, in this task sense, this named entity, this ambiguation. That replacing a randomness results in better performance in practice. Is this a very interesting question that I always sort of ask is that can we find a middle ground? Maybe I want to know about some characteristics of the data. Maybe not the, I mean, I don't want to train it on the entire distribution. I want to know about some overall distributions of the data. Will that help me select the randomness better? I don't know. I mean, uh, if for graphs, without giving you the graph, I give you the degree distribution. Can you design, do something here? I don't know. So, so currently, we're looking for applications of this to other learning problems um, and inside the computations. Uh, this is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much.